So tonight we're actually going to be covering a topic that is near and dear to me, um, which is the 12 link chain of dependent origination. And one of the reasons that I sort of developed an affinity for this teaching is that the first two or three times it was presented to me, I could not follow at all what I was being told about. And I think that's kind of the experience that most people had with this teaching. First of all, um, it's quite complicated. It's got 12 pieces at least. But the main idea behind this is to sort of give us a more nuanced view of dependent origination, which is a foundational teaching of Buddhism. And so one of the things that I find sort of interesting about this teaching is that in some of the stories about how the historical Buddha had his enlightenment experience under the Bodhi tree, the 12 link chain of dependent origination is extremely important. This was actually the insight that led him to awakening. And because of this, the 12 link chain of dependent origination is one of his most important teachings that he delivered to other followers. So the intended audience, if we look to the Threefold Lotus Sutra for this text, was a group called the Pratyeka Buddhas. So we think when we're looking at the sort of um, early Buddhism of these two groups of the Shravakas and the Pratyeka Buddhas, and the Shravakas are sort of the Buddha's disciples, literally the voice hearers, who he comes and uh, he, he comes to town, you know, he gives people teachings, etc. They ask him questions and they sort of follow him around and get a lot of instruction. Where the Pratyeka Buddhas go off on their own and they practice in solitude. And the 12 link chain of dependent origination, according to the Threefold Lotus Sutra, is a teaching that was given to the Pratyeka Buddhas. So these are people who don't need a lot of, uh, a lot of extra guidance, we could say. So... I wanted to look uh, just briefly at the Lotus Sutra in chapter 27, the a Buddha from the long distant past, universal surpassing wisdom Buddha, uh, is sort of visited by uh, the these heavenly kings who come from all of the different directions from other worlds because they see this light emanating when he awakens, and they come to find out what he has to say, and he teaches them three things. The first is the four noble truths. The second is the 12 link chain of dependent origination. And then the third is the Lotus Sutra. And they make a little bit of a point of the fact that he teaches them in this order. So if we look to that section, it says that uh, then the Tathagata, universal surpassing wisdom, agreed to the request made by the Brahma heavenly kings in the 10 directions and by the 16 princes. He rolled the Dharma wheel in 12 phases. That is the three dimensions of each of the four noble truths and this means the theory, the practice, and then the unity of theory and practice of the Four Noble Truths. And this cannot be done by Shramanas, Brahmins, heavenly beings, Maras, Brahmas, or beings of other realms. He told them, this is suffering, this is the cause of suffering, this is the extinguishment of suffering, and this is the way that extinguishes suffering. That's the Four Noble Truths. He thoroughly explained the teaching of the Twelve Causes and Conditions, or the Twelve Link Chain of Dependent Origination. Namely, that ignorance causes action, Action causes consciousness. Consciousness causes name and form. Name and form cause the six senses. The six senses cause contact. Contact causes sensation. Sensation causes craving. Craving causes clinging. Clinging causes existence. Existence causes birth. And birth causes aging, death, grief, lamentation, suffering, and distress. But then he gives the same teaching in reverse. If ignorance is extinguished, then action ceases, etc., all the way through the chain to the point where, <clears throat> and if birth is extinguished, then aging, death, grief, lamentation, suffering, and distress cease. And this is before he gives the famous parable of the chapter, with, which is the parable of the magic city. So that's another reason this teaching is actually very important, because this is one of the teachings that constitutes that magic city, which is a respite for people who are on the spiritual path. This is a way that we can have some relief from the sort of sufferings of life and death in our present lifetime. Uh, go to the next slide, please. So I kind of wanted to give some context for how this fits with the Four Noble Truths and the Four Seals of the Law, because I think this also helps clarify why the Twelve Causes are important. And this is actually a chart that's presented by uh, Mizuno in his Essentials of Buddhism, which is a great little book about sort of fundamental Buddhist teachings that gives pretty easy explanations. And so if we look at this, if we're talking about the sort of notion of causality, cause and effect, 
In a general sense, uh, we're talking about physical causation. We have two ways that this is talked about. Um, one of them is the temporal sense, with the arising of this, that arises, with the cessation of this, that ceases. And this is sort of common in the, in the poly canon. And then we have a spatial and theoretical version of that, which is when this exists, that exists. When this does not exist, that does not exist. And these are conveying similar things, but a sort of different aspect of them. So corresponding to the four seals of the law, the temporal part is the impermanence of things, and the spatial and theoretical part is that things are devoid of a persistent self, or the teaching of anatomy. In other words, uh, one side is highlighting their impermanence, and the other is highlighting the fact that they don't have causal independence. Everything is related to other things through causation. But then we look toward the, the as Mizuno labels it, the religious or mental type of causality. And this is where we get the 12 causes. And we have the 12 causes as arising, which corresponds to uh, the fact that all things are characterized by suffering. We're looking at how we start with a mistaken view and end up with dukkha. And this corresponds, of course, to the first two of the Four Noble Truths, the existence of suffering and a cause of suffering. So we see those through the 12 causes. Now, the conditions leading to nirvana, which would be the 12 causes in reverse, sort of where we're looking at starting with ignorance, if ignorance ceases, then action ceases, etc., all the way into to the cessation of dukkha. This corresponds to the fourth seal of the law, that nirvana is tranquil. And this can be mapped to the extinction of suffering and the way to the extinction of suffering, which is the Noble Eightfold Path, which is the fourth of the Four Noble Truths. And uh, next slide, please. So at this point, maybe you're wondering what these 12 are and what exactly is going on with them. So I didn't write them all over these slides because you have them on your handout, but in my explanation of them, I'm going to give a little bit more detail about them. But I want to give a short caveat before we jump into this. Number one, you don't need to memorize these to get something useful out of this teaching. They're complicated and they're not necessarily easy to memorize. What you want to do is develop an intuition and be able to see them in your experience in life. And if you ever need to do the 12, despite what your high school trade teacher told you, you can actually go look things up in the adult world. So you can pull this out later if you're having a hard time remembering what number four is or something. And the other side of this is that I think that the context is very important. So what we're trying to do with this teaching is to develop insight into why we feel dissatisfaction in life. So in this case, ignorance is a very specific type of ignorance. And we're talking, about, uh, we're talking about mistaken view, not understanding the nature of reality. And we could say very specifically that we're talking about a failure to grasp the Four Noble Truths. So in this case, if you believe that two plus two equals five, many people would tell you that you are probably ignorant, but it's not the type of ignorance that we're talking about. Which is actually, uh, there's a Sanskrit term Avidya, which shares, uh, which shares a common root with a word we all love, uh, video, and it actually refers to being unable to see something. And this is sort of echoed in the Japanese, right, where we have mumyo, which is uh, to be without light, it's not illuminated. And this refers to mistaken view, which is actually uh, the opposite of the first step on the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right view. So from here, if we don't understand the Four Noble Truths or the truth of dependent origination, it seems pretty clear that aside from some sort of fortunate coincidence, the actions that we begin to take will reflect our lack of understanding. So the term for actions in this sense is samskara, and it's not exactly the same as thinking about uh, deeds, words, thoughts, the things that we normally think of as action in Buddhism. This is sort of the very first movement that would lead to those things eventually. So it's the beginning of stirrings of action. And <clears throat> so while it refers to this sort of initial movement, uh, these are the seeds of actions that are arising from a mistaken view in this context. And they're not going to reflect right view, which means that this increases the likelihood that as we go through this chain, they're going to produce some sort of dissatisfaction. And this leads to uh, a form of consciousness. And this can be understood to mean uh, traditionally both the function of cognition 
and the mind as the subject of cognition. So this is a pure sort of undifferentiated consciousness. It's awareness as such, and it's arising from this first stirring of these actions that are coming from a mistaken view. The next link that comes up is name and form, and this can be seen as, uh, sometimes it's seen as the external side of consciousness, but it, it sort of refers, uh, in my understanding, a little bit more to the notion of uh, the separation that we have between our understanding of the physical and the mental. So it's, it's something that's happening in the mind, but we begin to form a dualistic conception from that consciousness that exists. And this becomes differentiated to a further degree into what we see as the six senses or the six sense organs. And those are dependent on this now differentiated mistaken consciousness that was differentiated into a sort of physical and non-physical sense. And then now it's perceived as six subdivided consciousnesses that are all unique. And now we have the possibility of what we experience as sense contact, which is the synthesis of the six sense organs, the organs themselves, with the things they're perceiving out in the world, and then the consciousness that arises from those. And so we sort of, we have, we have six types of contacts that can happen through the consciousness of the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, uh, via taste, uh, touch, and then of course the mental <coughs> sense, which is the sixth sense in Buddhism. And this, <laughs> so when we first have this contact, it's just the bare contact. It's the sensory experience through the sense sense organs and some sort of consciousness arising from that. And this leads to, uh, to feeling, or in our translation of the Heart Sutra, we use the term sensation. And that was also what was used in this translation of the Lotus Sutra that I used. And sensation is one of the aggregates, uh, as you might notice, and it's mentioned with several others in the, um, in the Heart Sutra. So feeling is sort of the next step after we have contact, feeling or sensation. And there are sort of three modes to that feeling or sensation, which are pain, pleasure, or neither. So what's happening here is the six sense organs, we're having some sort of sensory contact with something, and then there's the response, right? Do we feel like it's something enjoyable, or is it something we don't enjoy, or is it just neutral, it's just happening? And it really wouldn't be a problem if we just experienced it there and let it go. But since we're starting from a mistaken view, that's not really how things turn out. At this point, oh, uh, one more thing, and the notion of feeling is also determined by the individual. So you and I will have different ideas of what's a pleasurable experience or a painful experience or a neutral experience. And so this is sort of also important when you're thinking about this. So from here we move on to craving, and actually the notion of craving is related to thirst in, in the uh, actual the Sanskrit and the Pali. And, uh, Mizuno, Mizuno says that it's like the desperation of a dehydrated person seeing water, which is something that I kind of enjoy. Um, <laughs> so we also, like we had six sensations, we have six cravings. And those are, again, arising from the six sense organs. And what we crave is fulfillment of our desires. And uh, also we crave existence and we crave non-existence. And that might sound a little bit strange. This is sort of a traditional interpretation. But what this means is that uh, you have this feeling, and then you start to sort of develop this preference, right? This is the beginning of craving, but it's not a fully formed preference yet. But you're already sort of putting inertia into the future. You're already building up this thing that's going to lead you to dissatisfaction. You're already creating an expectation that can be mangled later. And it's through this desire to repeat this, this, this pleasant experience or to avoid this painful experience. But that's just the seed of craving. And then this sort of inertia gives rise to what we call grasping. And grasping is uh, a little bit more insidious. So originally there were four types of grasping, which were the grasping for sensuous desires, uh, stubborn and egocentric views, attachment to heretical practices, and ideas arising from the concept of a self which goes back to the four seals of the law, contradicting the notion of an Atman. So grasping is an expansion of the sort of longing or rejection that made up the cravings. And when we grasp at the things that we crave, we'll, we're setting ourselves up to a point where in the future we might do anything 
to try and get that experience again. And this is when we talk about attachment. This is sort of where we're at. So at this point, you still haven't actually, you haven't taken any action, but you're starting to have this experience that's going to lead to actions that are going to cause Uka. Well, here's where things get fun. So that inertia builds, right? And at this point, you, have, you are attempting to hold on to and give permanence to things that you crave. And this is the notion of becoming or existence. And this is still mental. This hasn't been brought into the world outside of your mind. So we might recognize that this is uh, connected to several other Buddhist terms that we see, like svabhava, self-existence, or parabhava, relative being of things brought about through causation. So becoming in the 12, in the 12 causes precedes birth and refers to both a karmic existence and a retributive existence traditionally. And this is uh, a view of existence in terms of good and bad, and the second type is existence in terms of the result of good or bad karma. So this longing or rejection is a cause combining with surrounding conditions and arising from grasping. And that accumulated en energy indicates what birth in this sense will follow. And grasping and becoming can be understood as corresponding to the earlier link of action, and craving can be seen as corresponding to the earlier link of ignorance. The actions arise from ignorance and contain both action and the residual power of habit, so that grasping, which arises from craving, gives rise to becoming as a result of the power of habit. The energy we put into our mistaken views becomes reified and solidified conceptually to such a degree that now it can be born, in a sense. And birth follows from becoming and refers to the action of a specific experience in life. A new experience arises with the previous links as its basis and can take the form of, here we finally have them, our deeds, our words, and our thoughts. And this means that what is born corresponds to the three mysteries in Buddhism, which are body, speech, and mind, the three karmic generators. Old age uh, and death, grief, sorrow, suffering, lamentation, and worry arise through birth, and this is seen as a truism in early Buddhism. To have experience or to be experienced, a person or thing must be born. And we can take this final stage to also be the cause of future ignorance, if we see this as a cycle. Uh, competing with, uh, completing this self-replicating cycle of samsara, or endless rebirths. Because we experience old age and death, we're often too distracted to take a longer, wise view and that will transcend our sort of fundamental ignorance of Four Noble Truths and dependent origination. And the cycle continues. Next slide, please. As you can imagine, uh, a lot of exegesis went into uh, sort of looking at this, and there are several different ways you'll see it interpreted. Two of the most interesting are uh, outer, most common, I guess, are outer causation and inner causation. And this gives you an idea of how one could talk about outer causation, which is that we take the 12 on the far left column and we can divide this up into the causes and effects of the past, present, and future. Ignorance and action being the causes of the past. Consciousness, name and form, the six senses, contact, feeling, these are the five effects of the present. Craving and grasping and becoming are the three causes of the present. And then birth, old age, and death are the two effects of the future. And when you combine all of these together, you have the causes and effects in the past, present, and future. This can also be seen as a teaching that responds to multiple generations where the two causes of the past are the generation of your parents, the five effects of the present and the three causes of the present are in your present life, and then birth, old age, and death are the generation of your offspring. And that's sort of a multi-generational view that we could think of as being related to ideas like intergenerational trauma and cycle breaking, those sorts of things we talk about in the 21st century. The other is inner causation, which is the way that I've covered this so far, where we're talking about our momentary experience. But what's wonderful about this teaching is that it can be applied across all of those domains of time. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we use this and what do we do about it? Yeah. Well, here's my simplified view of it. We start with mistaken view, that's number one. Two through 11 are living your life and number 12 is suffering. <laughs> I think that's a nice way to look at it. <laughs> So, the Buddhist solution was pretty obvious. Eliminate ignorance. Why not start at the beginning of the chain and cut it off there? You fix the problem. And he gives us a program to do that. He gives us a diagnostic tool with the treatment program, the Four Noble Truths, 
And the treatment program is the Eightfold Noble Path. First, get rid of your mistaken view by cultivating a right view. And then also practice right thought, speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. Now, this is a very fundamental Buddhist teaching, and at the risk of spending a lot of time talking about it, I'm not going to go into a long dissertation about why the Eightfold Noble Path is useful in this context. I want to point out, though, that that was the Buddhist solution. Start at number one. Cut it off there. You fix the problem. Next slide, please. Right view means belief in the four noble truths. That's that's uh, that right? we can we can take it to have a wider view than that, but I would say yeah, it's most fundamental level. It's that and dependent origination. Yeah. And so the <laughs> the next thing is uh, the next best thing is maybe we can catch it somewhere in two to eleven. Now, if you're a really advanced meditator then somewhere in your undifferentiated consciousness suit, you might be able to stop the first stirrings of action or notice that something is happening at the left, the first stirrings of consciousness, the differentiation into name and form, the six sense organs, contact, etc. But for most of us, I think the most salient factors in this are going to be at the stages of craving, grasping, and becoming. Now, these are also more difficult to stop things at because, as we were discussing, They've already been through all these stages and they've gained a lot of habitual or er, habitual energy. And so at the point that we're really getting to this close to the birth stage, where they're coming into our actual actions and thoughts, um, they've already got their hooks in pretty deep. So one of the best things that you can do is pay attention to what's going on in your daily life. And I know that's easier said than done, but it's also, you know, easier said than done for us to start from a right view and somehow keep that going at all times in our lives. The thing is, you're going to slip up, you're going to make mistakes. And the place to catch yourself is really, for me, the easiest when you get to this grasping stage. That's when you start to start to notice that you're, that you're really bothered when something about your plans for yourself changed. Especially at even the most trivial level, like, uh, you know, I wanted to stop off and get a couple of slices on the way home, and something came up, I couldn't do that. But you keep thinking about it, right? <laughs> it's like, I'm going to find some other way to like make this happen. Now, that's kind of a silly toy example, but the point's there. We have introspection at the level of grasping. We can look into that with some level of ease, and we can stop it there. And if you do, that actually stops you before you get to the level of suffering. Now, one of the things that's useful about having this many stages in the middle is that we can sort of see as the things develop, and then we can we can say, oh yeah, I'm noticing like this sort of thing going on, and stop it at that point in the chain because you have more differentiation. You have something that helps you develop insight and mindfulness into the process, leading from your mistaken view to the actual dukkha, to the actual dissatisfaction. One more slide, please. The problem is things are actually a lot more like this, <laughs> which is that you're always, <laughs> things are actually a lot more like this, which is that you're always already in the middle of a bunch of events all the time. And part of the reason for this is actually something about how uh, we process and perceive events. We construct events, first of all, and it's sort of trivial, I guess, to say that, but you know, just assuming that you don't believe me. Um, a good example of this might be when you are telling stories with your old friends and you're saying, oh yeah, remember when so-and-so and, -so and this, this happened and this person did this, et cetera. And they say, well, no, 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 actually though, that was a couple days earlier, you know, he had done this and that's why this whole thing happened. And then suddenly the situation is entirely different than how it was before. But those are two, process, two ways of processing the same event. And these are totally determined by how you think about them. We see something similar when you ask somebody for advice and they point out to you a really obvious solution that you would have never come to yourself. And you're sitting thinking, yeah, why didn't I think of that? I could have made one phone call and that totally fixes this whole problem. It's very easy for us to get lost into these cycles of dissatisfaction and sort of keep spinning our wheels and not be able to break out of them. So what if instead of having to wait for the stage of craving, et cetera, et cetera, we could say, well, actually at this link in the chain, let's look for the mistaken view in it. We could always dial it back to step number one if we needed to, because even those steps are themselves more constructed events. This teaching can be used with this fractal structure, 
where no matter what unit of time you want to use, you can still apply this teaching. It's about how we understand and process an event. So we can always look at a, sat a dissatisfaction that we have now, and we can run the clock back a little bit in our minds, and we can see <coughs> why is it this way. But then we can also say, right now, what is the mistaken view that's making me dissatisfied right now? That's another way to use the same teaching. And I know it sounds a little bit silly, maybe, that it would be that easy or whatever, but I mean, it really is. The trick is being able to develop the insight and the intuition to start thinking about and looking at things in those terms, to be able to find where there is some, some condition that you, as an actor, can change in that situation that allows you to correct that mistaken view, to change your perspective on what's happening in that situation, or to be able to break out of that cycle and move in a different direction. At any point, you can fix the mistaken view. It's not going to be permanently fixed, or else we violated the four seals of the law, which was one of the reasons that we had this teaching in the first place. We're just back into the yeah, we're just back into the same sequence that we were in before. But that's what I would challenge uh, the people who are here to try and do is look at it from a simplified perspective and try to find those cycles within cycles. Uh, for me, one of the things I found very useful was to develop toy examples in my head, look at that list of 12 and say, okay, in this common scenario I could think of, what does number six look like? And just game it out a little bit. You'd be surprised how intuitive the teaching actually is. But most of the time, that's not how we look at it. We look at this very complicated list of 12 things. There's all, these, all this exegesis about it and all kinds of things about how it applies to, you know, kalpas and kalpas of time. It's right here in front of us at all times. It could be applied to any unit of time. This is what we're actually living in. Well, I have, I, first I have a question, and then I have a, a comment. Uh, the, the question is, so you said initially that the first several times you saw this, you didn't get it. Yes. So you're going to do this every month for how many months? Um, <laughs> we can keep going. You know? Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, and that was that was did um, that did play into though um, how I tried to present this because in general the way that it had been presented to me in the past was people would give you the twelve and then uh, they would give an example and the example usually didn't fit with how the twelve actually sort of fit together in any of the Buddhist texts so it would be like sort of a close-ish reading. And it would be like, okay, well, you know enough now, so you know the 12 link chain of dependent origination, and I hope that helps. Go do it. Yep, and it's like, that's it. And so I really struggled with, like, what are we supposed to be getting out of this? It seemed really complicated, and I didn't really buy into the stuff where, uh, you know, so-and-so number of steps of these actually refer to the developmental stages of an embryo and, like, all of these kinds of things that are sort of the, the very metaphorical readings. It's more common. Yeah. yeah, they're like, this is a very traditional way of reading it, but it's, you know, one of the many ways that it's been applied. Yeah. Um, the, the comment that I had is that accepting everything you said, as, as you said it, as a given, I think that one of the difficulties is that it is difficult for us to recognize when a particular, at a particular point, let's say craving, as an example, that that craving that we have feels good and we want to pursue it when we shouldn't. <laughs> That's the difficulty we have with it. And, and so what right view really is dealing with is putting oneself in a perspective of then eliminating mentally those aspects that we know are not good to pursue this, but we would like to anyway, i.e., you know, I, 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 in a sense, I picture the, you know, the, the picture of the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other, and which one are we going to listen to? And that's, and that becomes a really very big issue because the term desires is sort of misleading because we all have desires and some desires are really good. You know, desires for an education is a good thing, as an example. Desire to be here tonight. Desire to be here Hopefully. tonight is a good thing, right? But so we're talking about unwholesome desires. But when it comes to unwholesome desires, it's really sort of difficult because some of those unwholesome desires may be pleasurable, but they're still unwholesome. They're still going to lead us in a way that we shouldn't we shouldn't go. So what this assumes 
if I would, if I can be so bold, is that we take an honest look at ourselves in relation to those things. And we often don't want to do that. That's something we don't want to do. We want, we want to project ourselves as what I want is what I need, as opposed to what I need is not the same as what I want. And so a kind of self-censorship is really necessary in this process and a self-assessment. And so that very beginning of the right view really, it, it, and, and Mushin is right, it's dealing with the fourfold noble truths primarily, but you can expand upon that. But at some point, it comes self-knowledge for understanding what right action really means. So that we, we, when we get to the craving part or any of the other points that are in there, in order to cut it off, we can do that. And we're willing to do that. Are we willing to do that is a different issue. Right. You know, it's, it's like, uh, and I'm going to use a, a, a practical sense, in a, a, you know, practical example. We know that universal health care would end a lot of misery in the country, but we don't have the political will to do it. We know that's what we need, and maybe also what we want, but we don't have the political will to do it for whatever reason. That's on a, a, that's on a more societal basis, but it's the same sort of thing on an individual basis. So that's my only comment. Yes, thank you, thank you. That's, I think, a really great clarification. And that actually, you know, when we looked at that section of the Lotus Sutra, I think that's part of the importance in why, uh, why this Buddha presented it as the Four Noble Truths first, and then the 12 link chain of dependent origination, because you really do need the Four Noble Truths as the foundation. You do need to have the Eightfold Path there for this teaching to really, to really be able to help you. Well, I guess it could help you otherwise, sort of. But I mean, really, the foundation is the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path.